I've got a question here that gets back to your collaboration. Maury, can you share some insights with us into the scalability of these solutions and their applicability to networks of various sizes and configurations? Yes. So um, we realized uh, in this uh, workload settings, um, the definitions from the operators, and then they will uh, explain their requirements, how many uh, radio units have to be supported at the field and also uh, what kind of a network interface required. And to reach level, to reach this level of expectations, the easy job is to build everything they ask, become an OEM type of hardware. But this easy answer will bring the, the side effect after, uh, the cost will go higher because it's become a proprietary design. So we use the building block strategies to, to make this possible. And this building block have a certain uh, components become flexible to be changed. Um, for example, we will use the Intel Westport channel and Logan Beach interface to support multiple 25G port. As a accelerators into it, the VRAM boost will allow us to uh, configure into a different workload. And in these densities, one single node, it will be okay in the one site. It certainly have to become up to three systems. And we also recognize if there is a way to put all this uh, uh, hardware requirement together into the same form factor and increase the densities, then then dramatically uh, can save the space for operator and also software partner to put more services uh, into the same area. And because of this requirement, we start to think about um, how to utilize those uh, uh, new technology introduced by Intel, and which is VRAM Boost technology and also the uh, Force Gen Xeon SP solution. These two, we still can keep it in a multiple sled design, the 2U form factor. So imagine you can have a, a similar DU design to the 2U uh, rec mount space and then able to support up to three individual nodes. So this is dramatically save lots of spaces and also to bring down the cost because you can share the power and share the power supply to support three the nodes. Um, this scalability really depends on the workload requirement. So certain area, one will be enough. We have the single node services, but if you want to change the configurations, we also can stay in the same form factor. And it's very, um, very persuasive to using this, uh, the same uh, form factor strategies to scaling through the different uh, CPU workload. And we really enjoy this uh, uh, advantage uh, introduced by Intel and also hope this can continue to support Rakuten Symphony, the software uh, workload requirement. And after this, we are also thinking more next steps. What if the customer expecting more density? Uh, we also offering now with a 2U4 node as well. So you can imagine 2U in the one node, three node and four node. This will dramatically change the game. And definitely if you uh, can find the right balance, also can save lots of costs uh, for the hardware selection as well. Thank you very much, Maury. Well, there's a question we have received here that moves away from technology. Um, in the context um, of these automation initiatives, let's not forget the most critical piece of this is people. And, and Jeff, let me put this one to you first. What are the organizational challenges of deploying automation in terms of the mindset of operational teams at operators? Yeah, uh, great question, Guy, and I, I think we've touched on this. I, I think the uh, the larger obstacles to actually adopting automation are uh, uh, organizational processes and and not the capabilities of people to do automation, but the capacity that people have to do automation at the same time as they're they're doing their day job, which is is very uh, taxing. I. Uh, there is a need to have a very much a, an automation first mindset. One of the processes that we have implemented in uh, our own operations in Japan, but also in, in our tooling, is that whenever there is an outage and we do root cause analysis, we ask the question, is this possible to automate? And uh, you, if you click and check that box, it automatically goes into a a, uh, a queue of potential use cases. And then the automation team, which was what I was mentioning previously, uh, select them based on business case impact. Uh, so 
releasing people to to actually think automation first is is a big deal and just giving support to allow inside the existing processes the introduction of that mindset uh goes goes a long way uh so uh the biggest barrier i think is the the just the reality of of how hard we're working keeping the lights on today Sure. Yeah. Thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, Caroline, do you want to comment on this question ab about uh, you know culture and, and people and mindset? It, it, actually, I, I would. It, it, Jeff actually said it really, really well. One of the things that we are looking at uh, at the at the uh, tip level uh, telecom infrastructure project, we've been asked by different operators, say, "How do I? Re there is a little bit of a different skill." set you do need to uh, add into the workforce for example we have done some training courses and one of the things that in addition to what uh, jeff said really adequately really well how do we make people doing day, day job and a half right and one thing that that being discussed i, I thought it's worthwhile uh, uh, looking at into some you, fundamentally you probably need to change the way that you uh, benchmark people you measure folks the performance goal needs to be shifted from just doing, you know, doing this repeatedly well. But like Jeff was talking about, if you find a way to, to do use cases, you find this tiger team, the center of excellence for automation. And that actually changes how the rest of organization view this issue. We, we found that in repeatedly, whenever it goes through some transformation inside a big corporation, you always have to have a team willing to take that on, like a tiger team. And, and do they show the example and that rinse and repeat, and the rest of the organization will adopt. But it is hard to, to change people and the, the behavior, and myself included, that we've done all we do this and all we've done this right. Why we have to change? But uh, changing the, the benchmark, setting up a, a tiger team, setting an example that a recipe, that you blueprint that you can rinse and repeat is very important. Indeed, it is. Thank you, Caroline. Um, We've touched on the issue of, of data already, but you know this is one key factor that has restricted automation capabilities, and that's been a lack of data availability. However, the use of network telemetry is growing. Maury, can you talk more about this and its potential for improving network service automation? Definitely. Um, before we start these topics, I think I want to also illustrate uh, the situation, the real one. We are at the field uh, working with the different parties. Um, first of all, um, because of the open RAN, it's no longer just that we provide a hardware to uh, Rakuten Symphony and Rakuten Symphony uh, have to handle everything together by themselves. Um, certain of the situations we, we at the field uh, working together, we realize uh, certain um, challenge, we have to bring everybody in the same rooms. When I say everybody, it's not like a hundred people, but it's closer to the numbers, like maybe including six companies sitting in the same meeting room, just need to prove how to guarantee those latency and how to guarantee those uh, parameters, telemetry uh, features will be properly shown on the dashboard in the existing operator network dashboard. And sometimes they get surprised because that they cannot see what they want or what they have in the past. So they expect uh, Supermicro and Rakuten Symphony to prove uh, how to reach the same performance. And I think in that journeys, we realized, uh, uh, I used the Carolina just mentioned, Tiger Team is a very right word. We don't want too many people uh, in the same room just at the point the different directions. So there's a very clear uh, uh, instructions and how to work together. And from the hardware level, we finished the setup and the guidance from the Intel about the flex run. Once we've done this part, we offered this to a uh, Rakuten Symphony uh, lab to certify and validate before moving to the live networks. This whole steps, once we finish, even you brought everything to the, the, the location in the operator live network, we still get some surprised. And then to solve the surprise, uh, your beginning question asking how to control, it's actually the key and the evidence to show the data is actually there. And then uh, we have to uh, adjust our exporter for those parameters and then allow the uh, Rakuten Symphony sim world to grab all those things in the control interface and then share back with the live network. And those settings also need to be highly secure with the ball management function like the BMC 
and the refresh through the different operating system support. And there are many steps. Uh, I think in short, looking at a hybrid is pretty simple and using the service is also very convenient, but to connect all the things together in a very flexible infrastructure, it's actually pretty challenged, which is probably the reason why the open run have a few leaders can, can make it become the real case at the field. And Broker 10 Symphony definitely the one. And we enjoy these uh, settings. I think it's very challenging. I never say it's easy. So Jeff gave lots of uh, good questions and we learned a lot. So we are going to make it better for Broker 10 Symphonies. Thank you, Maury. And, and Jeff, uh, let's go over to you. Do you want to pick up on uh, Maury's comments there about network telemetry? Yeah, I, I think uh, the whole industry understands that uh, uh, the importance of uh, observability frameworks uh, is growing and uh, the uh, accessibility to data uh, when it's needed and the fidelity and, and that data being in the right location. I think we can learn a lot uh, from industries outside of telecom, such as in the, the internet space and the, uh, uh, the large cloud players who've instrumented their systems very much from an observability uh, paradigm. And that's, that's something that we have in operation uh, and it's, it's a, uh, a source of truth that's required if you want to, to start to really understand at a system level what your, your network is doing. Thank you, Jeff. Well, we've still got time for just a, a couple more questions that have been sent in from our viewers. So let's get on to the next one here. Um, Intent-based end-to-end automatic provisioning is indispensable for real network slicing service by 5G standalone for applications like autonomous driving, etc. Um, can our panelists share any experiences they have of this or possible solutions? Jeff, do you want to take this first and then perhaps we can hear quickly from Caroline? Jeff? Yeah, and I, I, my answer will be very, very simple. And it, it, it's actually something Caroline said uh, earlier. It's a great example of how complexity is increasing and automation always helps with complexity. Uh, uh, it's going to be impossible to provide such services in the future uh, without automation. So the only question that we have uh, as a business is the priority you put in solving that use case uh, versus all the other automation use cases that you have in your pipeline. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. Uh, Caroline, do you want to pick up on uh, Jeff's comments? Yeah, so network slicing is a great example of how the next step for the, the uh, automation you need to drive to. If we're going to offer a, a network size, you, you mentioned autonomous driving, just even look at connected car. Understanding the use cases, you're working backwards. How do we need to, to provide enough data and the enough, uh, uh, in, the intent base is really about designing from the use cases back. And so we're more and more looking at the network, 5G network, we need to start serving enterprises. The observability framework is a must have. It's not even optional. No enterprise is willing to take this out unless they know in a single dashboard what the network is doing, how the slice is guaranteed bandwidth, uh, you know, spectrum, latency, security, and uh, jitter. All of that has to be designed in from the from the slice level. So we have so much conversation at CTIA and as board. We're always looking at this as if we wanted to make network size, which I is a must have for 5G, the increase our reachability into enterprises. For example, this observability, the the everything we talked about, the telemetry, the automation process is no longer even an optional. It's a must have. So I think the work that we've done to make VRAN open RAN work in a discovery network is a really sets us very well to take the network slice deep into very critical uh, inf uh, critical infrastructure like a oil and gas industry, uh, manufacturing, uh, connected car, even healthcare. Uh, so that is that's a great hope, and that the work that we've done together sets up at a really good really good foundation. 